I wanted to change my life. And I think most people that are miserable or that are that are really like dying to be great and dying to have more, we want to change. We want to live a better life. We want to create more for our families. We want to be happier. The the desire is there. Again, it's about how do you go from knowledge to action. So the first thing in this story that's important is realizing that the answer was in me. And my mind was telling me, pay attention. It's your job to push yourself. All performance, all improvement in personal performance begins with an improvement in your self-concept. All improvement in personal performance in what you do on the outside begins with an improvement in your self-concept in your beliefs about yourself. When you change your beliefs about yourself on the inside, you change the reality of your life on the outside. You need to understand the subconscious mind of yours. Your subconscious mind rules your life. 96 to 97 percent of everything that you do is done as a result of your subconscious mind. And when your subconscious mind gets programmed, it goes ahead and responds to whatever it is your conscious mind has placed into it. The subconscious mind of yours is most impacted by your feelings. A change of feeling is a change of destiny. Your perception of your world is what controls your genes. And if you're not feeling well, the issue is you don't have to change your biology, you just have to change your perception. And this will then give you your power back. And this is what we have to recognize. We're not victims of biology, we are masters of our biology. It is our attitude toward life which will determine life's attitude toward us. Let's face the fact honestly that we shape our own lives and the shapes of them will be determined by our attitudes. A person with a poor attitude toward learning, for example, isn't going to learn much until he changes his attitude. If we take the attitude that we cannot do something, we generally will not do it. An attitude of failure and we're whipped before we start. So we know then that what we receive from life, what we accomplish or fail to accomplish, is due in large measure to our overall attitude. Do you know when a person improves their self-image, they change their entire life. Their income changes, their relationship changes, their health changes. Do you know how you do that? Start studying you. Start to find out more about you. There's something phenomenal about you. The idea that your thoughts create, that's powerful. Most people don't even know that. Most people lead lives, as Thoreau said, of quiet desperation. And so they're living to their grave as a victim. They don't know that they have power. They don't know that they have choice. They don't know that they can set an intention and actually move in the direction of it, which is the basics of the law of attraction. As Emerson said, you become what you think about most of the time. Earl Nightingale, in his strangest secret of success, simply said that you become what you think about all day long. So what we have found is, is that our outer world is merely a reflection or corresponds with our inner world. In computer language, they have an expression, Geigo, which means garbage in, garbage out. But it also means good in, good out. Now, if the human being was like an animal and that we were programmed permanently and could never change our instincts and our responses, then we would have no hope. But the good news is that everything that we have learned, we can unlearn. That everything that has been programmed into us can be deprogrammed and can be overridden with new programming. And we say, number one, your self-concept is the master program of your subconscious mind. It's the master program. Your self-concept is your operating system. Everything that you produce on the outside is determined, modified, affected in some way by your self-concept. You cannot change what is being produced on the outside without changing your operating system. So that's the first thing we know. Second, we say you always perform on the outside based on how you think on the inside. You always perform on the outside based on how you think on the inside. My whole thing is, I'm constantly reminding people, there is only one enemy in your life, that's you. 
If you fix this one person, everything is fine with you. Yes or no? You have only one enemy, that's yourself. If you fix this one person, this is a wonderful life. Getting control of your mind, taking charge of your consciousness is a way of overcoming those limitations. There are many different ways to, to take this control back in, in your life. Uh, and one of them is the, the ability to, uh, like in yoga for example, to be the master of your mind and not let it run the monkey mind. Let it run. No, I want this. I don't, don't let this other one go. When you have an idea, you have to take action. I even say it's your job. So learning that your mind creates, that's powerful. But you also learn that your body has to have the follow through and you have to take action to co-create what you want to manifest. Ask yourself, what beliefs and perceptions about you and your life have you been unconsciously agreeing to that you'd have to change in order to create this new state of being? This is a question that requires some thought because as I said, with many of these beliefs, we aren't even aware that we believe them. Often, we accept certain cues from our environment that then prime us to accept certain beliefs, which may or may not be true. Either way, the moment we accept the belief, it has an effect not only on our performance, but also on the choices we make. In the study about the women taking the math test who first read fake research reports about men being better than women in math, those who'd read that the advantage was due to genetics scored lower than those who'd read that the advantage was due to stereotyping. Although both reports were false, men are no better at math than women. The women in the group who'd read that they had a genetic disadvantage believed what they'd read and then scored lower. It was the same with the white men who were told that Asians score slightly better than whites on a test they were about to take. In both cases, when the students were primed to unconsciously believe they wouldn't score as well, they in fact didn't, even though what they were told was totally false. With this in mind, take a look at this list of some common limiting beliefs and see which ones you may be harboring without being fully aware that you're doing so. I'm not good at math. I'm shy. I'm short, tempered. I'm not smart or creative. I'm a lot like my parents. Men shouldn't cry or be vulnerable. I can't find a partner. Women are lesser than men. My race or culture is superior. Life is serious. Life is difficult and no one cares. I'm never going to be a success. I have to work hard to make it in life. Nothing good ever happens to me. I'm not a lucky person. Things never go my way. I never have enough time. It's someone else's responsibility to make me happy. When I own this particular thing, then I'll be happy. It's hard to change reality. Reality is a linear process. Germs make me sick. I gain weight easily. I need eight hours of sleep. My pain is normal and it'll never go away. My biological clock is ticking. Beauty looks like this. Having fun is frivolous. God is outside of me. I'm a bad person, so God doesn't love me. I could go on forever, but you get the idea. Since beliefs and perceptions are based on past experiences, then any of these beliefs that you happen to hold about yourself came from your past. So are they true, or did you just make them up? Even if they were true at some point in time, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're true now. We don't look at it that way, of course, because we're addicted to our beliefs. We're addicted to the emotions of our past. We see our beliefs as truths, not ideas that we can change. If we have very strong beliefs about something, evidence to the contrary could be sitting right in front of us, but we may not see it because what we perceive is entirely different. We've, in fact, conditioned ourselves to believe all sorts of things that aren't necessarily true. And many of these things are having a negative impact on our health and happiness. Changing beliefs may be difficult, but it's not impossible. Just think what would happen if you were able to successfully challenge your unconscious beliefs. Instead of thinking and feeling, I never have enough time to get everything done. What if you instead thought and felt, I live in no time and I accomplish everything. What if instead of believing the universe is conspiring against me, you believed. The universe is friendly and works in my favor. 
What a great belief. How would you think? How would you live? And how would you walk down the street if you believe the universe works in your favor? How do you think that would change your life? When you change a belief, you have to start by first accepting that it's possible, then change your level of energy with a heightened emotion, and finally allow your biology to reorganize itself. It's not necessary to think about how that biological reorganization will happen or when it's going to happen. That's the analytical mind at work which pulls you back into a beta brain, wave state, and makes you less suggestible. Instead, you just have to make a decision that has finality and once the amplitude or energy of that decision becomes greater than the hardwired programs in your brain and the emotional addiction in your body, then you are greater than your past. Your body will respond to a new mind and you can affect real change. You already know how to do this. Think about a time in your past when you made up your mind to change something about yourself or your life. If you recall, a moment came when you probably said to yourself, I don't care how I feel. It doesn't matter what's going on in my life and I'm not concerned how long it will take. I'm going to do this. Instantly, you got goosebumps. That's because you moved into an altered state of being. The moment you felt that energy, you were sending your body new information. You felt inspired and you came out of your familiar resting state. That's because by thought alone, your body moved from living in the same past to living a new future. In reality, your body was no longer the mind. You were the mind. You were changing a belief. So it makes sense that we should concentrate not merely on avoiding negative emotions like fear and anger, but also on consciously cultivating heartfelt positive emotions such as gratitude, joy, excitement, enthusiasm, fascination, awe, way, inspiration, wonder, trust, appreciation, kindness, compassion, and empowerment to give us every advantage in maximizing our health. Studies show that getting in touch with positive, expansive emotions like kindness and compassion, emotions that are our birthright, by the way, tends to release a different neuropad called oxytocin which naturally shuts off the receptors in the amygdala, the part of the brain that generates fear and anxiety. With fear out of the way, we can feel infinitely more trust, forgiveness, and love. We move from being selfish to selfless. And as we embody this new state of being, our neurocircuitry opens the door to endless possibilities that we never could have even imagined before because now we're not expending all our energy trying to figure out how to survive. Scientists are finding areas in the body like the intestines, the immune system, the liver and the heart as well as many other organs that contain receptor sites for oxytocin. These organs are highly responsive to oxytocin's major healing effect which has been linked to growing more blood vessels in the heart, stimulating immune function, increasing gastric motility, and normalizing blood sugar levels. The frontal lobe is our ally in mental rehearsal. That's true because, as we established earlier, the frontal lobe helps us unplug from the body, the environment, and time. The three main focuses of someone who's living in survival mode. It helps us get past ourselves to a state of pure consciousness where we have no ego. In this new state, as we envision what we desire, our hearts are more open and positive emotion can flood through us. So that now the loop of feeling what we're thinking and thinking, what we're feeling is finally working in our favor. The selfish mindset we were in when we were in survival mode no longer exists because the energy we channeled towards survival needs has now been freed up for us to create. It's as though someone paid our rent or mortgage payment for the month so that we have extra cash to play with. Now we can understand exactly why it is that if we hold a clear intention of a new future, marry it to a state of expansive elevated emotion, and repeat that over and over until we've created a new state of mind and a new state of being, these thoughts will seem more real to us than our previous limited view of reality. We're finally free. And once we truly embrace that emotion, we can more easily fall in love with the possibility that we've been envisioning. The symphony conductor, frontal lobe, 
feels like a kid in a candy store, excitedly and joyfully seeing all sorts of creative possibilities for new neural connections that can combine to form new neural nets. And as the conductor unplugs us from the old state of being and switches on the circuits in this new state of being, our neurochemicals begin delivering new messages to our cells, which are now prepared to make epigenetic changes that signal new genes in new, empowering ways. And because we've used heightened emotions to make it seem as though it's already happened, we're signaling the gene ahead of the environment. Now we're no longer waiting for the change and hoping for the change. We are the change.